Hello everyone and welcome to another episode in the series of things you may have missed in The Witcher 3. It's been a while since I last made one of these, but there is still more of the game to cover, so here we are. Before we begin, this video is brought to you by me, so allow me to plug my Witcher details playlist. There's a whole bunch of half-decent Witcher-related videos there, which, in case you haven't watched already, might pique your interest. Okay, without further delay, let's begin. I'd like to start with something small, which I had originally planned on mentioning years ago when I made that video about the Skellige lines. However, there were so many of those that I ended up dedicating the whole episode to them exclusively. But in addition to the curious shapes and pictures you can see from the mountains, there is another clever detail at the peak of Eustinia's Grotto. There is this obelisk or however it's called, with a couple of dead bodies beside it, one of which has a lootable poem, which suggests that we should follow the shadow of the obelisk to find treasure. The nature of the corpses remains a mystery, perhaps related to the fate of the rest of Caer Galen, but nevertheless, if we follow the shadow of the peak exactly at high noon, it does actually point to a treasure chest down in the valley. There is also a curious detail involving the bandits in the caves below, but you can check that in the previous episodes. Before we leave Skellige, however, there is another thing I'd like to show you, which sadly is not part of the game by default. It's another addition by the Brothers in Arms mod, which in this case restores a removed scene that I think should have stayed in the game. It's about the bard you are sent to by Ermion, you know, the old man waiting for the white whale to show up. Avend, what? I... <sighs> Normally, he simply shuns you if you tell the truth, and that's the end of the entire interaction. I've seen through you, you conniver. Cut me the bits if you like, I'll never tell you about the cavern. <sighs> The mod, however, unlocks a continuation of this outcome, which, while still unsuccessful, becomes much more rewarding. After he refuses to help you, you can bring up the extinguished signal pyre next to him, which, by the way, does not exist at all in the default version of the game, and after which you can help him light it up and get some extra dialogue. Cut me the bits if you like, I'll never tell you about the cavern! <sighs> Forgetting anything? Eh? Hey. Oh yes, that the pyre, all that chatting. I'll be tender soaked. So what am I to use to let me help? You're kind to help. Don't mention it. As to the elven runes, truth is... Yeah. Let it go. Leave them be. Surely you have other ways to make a living. You needn't resort to crude looting. So you won't tell me how to find them? No, I won't. But I'm grateful for your help. Farewell. And fortune smile upon you. Normally, there's a small cut in the dialogue, which I edit it out for your convenience. It goes like this. Farewell. And fortune smile, smile upon you. And it shows that the scene was left somewhat unfinished. Additionally, there's a group of people nearby discussing the whole signal fire situation. And they have also been restored. They don't normally exist. Ugh, Avon failed to light the signal fire again. Someone should go there. Don't dare look at me. My job's to stand here and watch, not quarrel with that loon. Your watching will be for naught if our lads don't see the signal. I think their dialogue ties well with another couple of nearby women who are actually in the game. Yana, it'll be three weeks since the storm now. You've naught to look out for. He's not coming back. You don't know that? Maybe his rudder broke? He was set adrift? Maybe Siren saved him? We've both heard the stories. Tales, Yana. They're naught but fairy tales. If the seed only give back his body, 
I've sewed him a lovely shirt. He'd be dressed as fine as a Jarl for the funeral. So yeah, I have no idea why they didn't officially restore this for the next gen edition. I think it simply makes the bad outcome more rewarding and meaningful, which is very much in the spirit of the game in general. And now that I mentioned the Brothers in Arms mod, there is another curious thing that was brought to my attention by one of the contributors to the mod, Glassfish specifically, I've already mentioned him in a video before, he showed me a small alternative to the very last scene from the ending where Ciri becomes a witcher. Instead of it ending with Ciri sheathing her sword, Let's try it out then. She and Geralt head towards Elanda to meet Yennefer. That is where the Temple of Militale is in the books. Let's try it out then. The path awaits. Come on. Yenna waits in Olander. We can meet her in two days if we hurry. There should be an alternative for Triss as well, but regardless, there was apparently supposed to be more to this ending. On their way to the temple, Geralt and Ciri would do a contract together, supposedly on a manticore, and that's where the game was meant to end. It is unclear why this part was scrapped. The person I talked to speculated that they either ran out of time or they thought it would be too similar to the Empress ending where Geralt and Ciri also fight a monster. But um, why not? Additionally, I've always wondered why, unlike the Empress ending, we don't get to see or hear of Triss or Yennefer at all. And apparently they were supposed to be mentioned originally. It's interesting to think about how the game might have looked if everything they planned for was developed. It's safe to say that The Witcher 3 must have been an incredibly ambitious project, especially given how much smaller CDPR was back then. But now, since we mentioned the Empress ending, here is another small but, in my opinion, incredibly rare detail that takes place here. This time we do not need mods, but rather a specific circumstance. Years ago, I made this video where I showed you all the different variations in Dandelion's visit after the ending of Blood and Wine. There are quite a lot, by the way. But in there, I speculated that despite some of the things we see in the video, there might be a unique piece of dialogue with him during the Empress ending. If you got to the point in the story where Priscilla gets assaulted and then proceed without helping her at all. When I made the video, I did not have the proper save to test it, you know, without having to replay half the game, so I decided to leave it there for the time being. But since then, a viewer of mine has told me that there is in fact such a unique line, and eventually I ended up replaying it so that I can show it to you. Normally, the scene in the ending goes in one of two ways. Either you've seen Priscilla after she was attacked and helped her by finishing the quest. No need for the Count to get riled. Rather, you told us how your beloved is. Recovered, mostly. Even started singing again. Her voice is a little lower pitched, gravelly. Actually, sounds a little better. Thanks for helping back then, Geralt. Meant a lot. Really. What are friends for? Give her my best. Or you never found out what happened to her in the first place. No need for the Count to get riled. Rather, you told us how your beloved is. She's recovered. Back to full health physically, mentally, almost. Recovered? What did I miss? Ah. Right. Ended up not hearing about it? She was attacked. Around the time you were in Novigrad. Bagarhat does something awful. But, as I said, she's getting better even started performing again. Thank the gods. Give her my best. But as I suspected, there is a third variation where you saw what happened, you said you would help, and then decided not to. It's really small, but it's great that they thought about this possibility. No need for the Count to get riled. Rather, you told us how your beloved is. Recovered, mostly. Even started singing again. Her voice is a little lower pitched, gravelly. Actually, sounds a little better. Sorry I couldn't help you out. I had to... Forget about it, Geralt. Done and gone. Give her my best. 
Okay, next, I would like to bring up two somewhat conspiratorial points. Normally, I'm not a huge fan of those, you know, things like Triss is actually coral and whatnot, but I found this rather interesting, so here they are. The first one is about the strange beast contract in Skellige. Not counting blood and wine, this has got to be the single highest paying contract in the game, or at least among the very top, for sure. However, neither the quest giver nor the location seem particularly special or wealthy, yet you can haggle for over 600 crowns, and even the base reward is rather high. You want to bargain? How would you count it? Height and hands at the withers, or...? Mm, by species. Drowner's less than a cockatrice. Aha! Uh -huh. But we've no notion what prowls the high road. What do you say you cut it down and then we'll talk? Mm-mm. <clears throat> we pre-agree a price. Define a bonus for unforeseen risks. Hey. So, how much? <laughs> That's what you'd ask for a golden dragon, maybe? No chance. Ah, have it your way. Tis your neck on the line. So, a viewer of mine had a curious theory about it, you've likely seen him featured in other videos, and he speculated that it has something to do with Yennefer. Actually, maybe you're right. A little help can go... Of course I'm right. You see, the contract takes place in Larvik, which is the very same place where Yennefer stays between the wake at Kerr Trolda and the conclusion of her personal quest in Skellige. The theory is that Yennefer somehow contributed to the high reward so that Geralt can get a higher pay. And that theory actually has a strong basis in the books. There is a point in the original story where we see Yennefer using her wealth and connections to secretly help Geralt financially. You know how he's always barely making ends meet? So she makes an arrangement with the bank to boost the bounties Geralt is after, or something along those lines, and do it all in secret. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it takes place after she and Geralt separate, following that nasty business with Istrid. I'm getting a little confused with the Netflix show, it does these things differently. So now, suddenly we have this super rewarding contract right where Yennefer settles, and I can definitely see the appeal to speculate. Sadly, one major issue is that the reward is the same even if you do the contract before you meet Yennefer in Skellige, which is something you can do. However, if you follow the main quest, you will end up doing it after she arrives here, so make of it what you will. And if you have any alternative theories about the unusually high reward, do let us know. And the second thing I'd like to bring up is about our dear darling Triss. In my last video, I talked about her house in Novigrad, but another viewer of mine showed me something about her future house, the one she bought for herself and Geralt in Kovir. First off, he noticed that the building we see in the watery reflection is actually in the game. It's the well-decorated house next to the Cunny of the Goose. By the way, did you know that you can actually see Geralt and Triss in this picture? And also, did you know you can play a little game with this bucket over here? But anyway, the speculation goes even deeper, because the loot inside the house changes after the ending of the game. And my viewer thought that the candle and the pipe symbolize Geralt and Triss together. Let me guess, with a candlelit dinner? Candles, sure. And a bed. I could put it on one evening. We'll dine outside by candlelight, listen to the music of the cicadas. And what are you doing? Running around swamps, killing drowners? No. I'm sitting on the porch in a rocking chair, smoking my pipe, listening to the clink of your vials as you work inside. That simple? Mm-hmm. However, in my testing, I noticed that other loot changes as well, and not just inside the house, but outside as well. 
There is this uh, barrel or sack or something by the door of the inn and the loot inside changes correspondingly to the loot inside the house. So ultimately, even though I can't quite explain the rules that govern these changes of the loot, it does seem to be a mere accident. Also, to be honest, if I saw a candle and a pipe, I'd probably think it's a Yorveth reference, since that is what he was dreaming about along with some baked carrots or something? I think someone once provided a translation of what Jorvet says in that vision. And speaking of food, the final thing I have for you today is a silly little detail about the Emmentaler sword. Have you noticed that it actually dismantles into cheese? Unfortunately, Hattori's sword does not dismantle into a dumpling, nor does the Rose of Sherwed dismantle into flowers, so, with that, I believe I'm done for now. Do let me know what you think of everything I talked about, whether you've noticed these details before, some of them are related to mods, but regardless, I'd be curious to know your thoughts. Cyberpunk's expansion is just around the corner, so I'll be going into that next. There's bound to be more Witcher videos afterwards though, so thank you very much for watching, thank you for your support on Patreon and the YouTube membership, and until the next video, Stay tuned and be good.